Thank you. Hey, everybody, welcome. All righty, everyone. Let's uh, work our way back to your seats, if you would. Oh, it is a chatty group today. Isn't that great? All right, here we come. Good morning. All right, everyone, welcome. It's my chance to get to welcome you here. And uh, 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 one thing we want to do that's going to be a little bit different than we've done in some previous uh, Sundays is, uh, is I've got some scripture. Now, I've had scripture to share before. But as you know, and I will remind you, is a lot of the songs that we're singing, ideally most all of the songs that we're singing, are either talking about scriptural um, stories, themes. In some cases, it's directly scripture. But there is great value, I think, in us as well in saying the word of God. And, uh, and so we're going to start that this morning. Now, what I've got pulled up for us is Psalms 150, verses 1 through 6. Now, verse 1 through 6 entails the entire book or entire chapter of, of Psalm 1, uh, 150. And, uh, and it is amazing because as you read through this, what you realize is, is this is uh, David saying, uh, giving us a prescription for worship, which is pretty amazing. So together, why don't we read this scripture? Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty government. Praise him for his mighty acts. And praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. And praise him with the trumpet and dance. Uh, praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clanging cymbals. And let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, this, this psalm is amazing, and we're going to bring it back for the next few weeks and just dissect a few of these different verses. But suffice it to say that Psalm 150 is a prescription for worship. It talks about who should worship, why we should worship, who we are worshiping, how we should go about that, what instruments are legal, what we should do even with our bodies in worship, and, uh, and ultimately with the goal of, of praising God because God is worthy of our praise. So with that, let's move into our time of worship. We're going to uh, jump into our, these two songs. I'll tell you that as we're finishing up that second song, we're going to move directly into prayer. So if you have any prayer requests that, uh, that you haven't had a chance, well, nobody's had a chance, so you, some of you haven't had a chance, feel free to write those down and just walk them up. You're not going to distract us in the least, um, but you can leave your prayer requests if you want to write them down at the altar. All right.
on him the Lord of peace, whose power our scepter sways. From pole to pole that wars may cease, and all be prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and around his peace it be. The powers of the dice extend. Still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense, so I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength, cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad I put my faith in Jesus cause he's never let me down he's faithful through so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. Oh, 
thankful so thankful that you won't fail us and Lord you call us children and we get to come before your throne Lord right now we're in your throne room your presence is around us and Lord you say that when we ask in Jesus name it will be done and so Lord there are so many here that have so many people on their hearts they're sick they're fighting cancer they're struggling with suicide struggling with anxiety Lord, they're wondering if you're real. They're thinking about the times they prayed and they're not sure that you've ever answered them. Lord Jesus, you died for those. You died for those. We're thankful and so Lord, we just come in the name of Jesus and we just thank you that every prayer request you, you listen. Sometimes I'm so bad at listening, but you're not. You're the ultimate listener, the ultimate forgiver. Lord, we just come in an attitude of surrender and of faith, knowing that you're going to give us exactly what we need. And Lord, encourage us to not stop pressing in for healing. Father, you are a physician. You are the good physician. You are the ultimate physician. So we thank you for healings that are going to take place. We thank you for the migraines that are going to leave and never return. We thank you for the COPD that's going to leave and never return. We thank you for the cancer that's going to leave and never return. For the things that people are fighting that they don't understand what's wrong. They're just ill. We thank you that that's going to go and never return. We thank you for health in our bodies. We thank you for loving us, for pouring into us, Lord, to help us to seek your face with all we are. We thank you, Father. We thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name. Spin. 
he won't. You know, I was talking to someone before the service, and roughly this time last year, this person was in the hospital with COVID, and they're walking around right now. And I think it's important that we remember how God has worked in our life uh, because he never fails, not once. Amen? You may be seated, but I'm going to have this young lady stay up for a moment. If you notice inside, oh, Children's Church is dismissed. Uh, In your pews, you'll find a little card like this. We talked about this last week. Um, I'm just going to show you real quick how this might work, okay? There's many different ways that you can use this card. This card on one side has Medina Community Church. It has some information uh, when we worship and where we're at. But on the back side, there's a special invitation with this, uh, what's it called? Uh, Yeah, You, you basically take your phone out. You open up the camera app, you point it at this squiggly thing, and it will uh, give you a chance to open up a browser, and there will be a personal message from me as the pastor of this, as well as uh, some answers to life's uh, biggest questions. And, and, and I think the idea is that anytime anyone gives you something, let's say you're at a restaurant, and before you give that tip, say, oh, by the way, I have something else to give to you. Uh, This is an invitation from my church, and on the back you'll find a a video invitation from our pastor as well as the answer to life's most difficult questions. You know, questions about the church, is it relevant? The Bible, is it true? Uh, Questions about uh, various types of cults out there, you know, how, how does the Bible respond to that? as well as science and evolution and abortion and pornography. It's it's all in there. It's all in one package. I guess the point is you don't have to be a uh, licensed evangelist. All you need to do is simply give a card to someone and say, hey, we'd love for you to come and be a part of our church. So Anna's up here. Uh, She's the victim, if you will. Um, I have a card, and I'm going to say, hey, by the way, um, uh, I just have an invitation for you from our church, and you can see a picture of our church, and on the back side you see a little squiggly thing there, and all you have to do is take your camera out and take a picture, and it, it will open up an app, and you'll have an invitation from the pastor. I hear he's really good, and um, there's also answers to life, some, some of the most uh, difficult questions, so um, here you go. Thank you. And by the way, can I say a quick prayer for you? So, uh, Lord, I pray for Annie, and I, and I pray, Lord, that you just bless her and, and give her a great day and just show her how big and awesome you really are and guide us through uh, the day. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Was that okay? I mean, uh, take a card. Uh, they'll be here every Sunday. Uh, look for opportunities. In fact, wake up. And ask God to put someone specific on your heart who needs a word of encouragement. And ask him for opportunities, and over and over again, he'll give you those opportunities. Okay, uh, we have a time of witness. If God has done something in your life, we'd love to hear it. Um, i got a mic right here, so anyone want to give a time of witness? Mr. Lee Bailey. You know, we were talking about God's faithfulness, and uh, I want to give a, I brought four guys with me today. You all know some of them. Well, give them a card. Yeah, y'all need a card. Y'all know Jesus. So I can guarantee you all four of these guys know Jesus, but um, Chuck's been here. Chuck Ballard has uh, taught the Thompson Bible, uh, Chain Reference Bible uh, course here and preached here once, and then... Uh, Curtis Jones is right next. He's along. We all go back to the early 80s at our little church in San Antonio and God's faithfulness through the years. Tom Shanick, he's the little guy. And then Mike, Mark, Mike Rogers. Why did I say Mark? Um, but these have all been dear friends in Christ and brothers and sisters and God's faithfulness in our lives through the years. And so I just wanted to recognize them. Their wives are all out with Nancy. But um, and here's a little bit of trivia. How many of y'all saw the uh, Little League Baseball game where the pitcher beamed the the batter? Did y'all see that one? And then the the 
batter felt ran to first base after they checked him out, and then the guy, the pitcher's just in, you know, top crying. Well, there's one of those four that was uh, umpire at second base, Curtis, and uh, was right. That was right in front of him. He told us that yesterday. So, pretty little neat piece of trivia. But those are dear friends in Christ for over 40 years. All right. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I see Stephanie making her way up. I also see Bev. Come on down. Um, yeah, right there. Okay. Um, so I wanted to share that I am grateful for. Hey, hi. Oh, I'm grateful for my community and women here in this community. I am going through a season in life where I may not be childbearing anymore, and that is very confusing for my family and for myself because I don't know what's going on. So, you know, these mood swings, this irritability, these not sleeping, hair loss, weight gain. I mean, I'm like, wow, this is a foreign body. I don't know day to day how I'm going to feel. And I had fear to open up about this. And I had fear to reach out to my community because my mom is no longer here. So I don't have a mom to reach out to. And my mother-in-law lives in, an, in Missouri, so you know I can't really just kind of talking about this over the phone doesn't really do me justice. So I reached out to several women in our community, in our church community, and said, you know, I'm going to be a little transparent and I'm really kind of scared, but I don't know what's going on. And they really embraced me, literally embraced me. Um, they made me feel beautiful and reminded me that I'm beautiful during this season when I don't feel beautiful and it just gave me such comfort to know these women are going through this with me and that we're not by ourselves and so you know it just reminds me to you know say a prayer for women in our community that are and their spouses because it's confusing it's irritating for them it's irritating for us and and pray for them and pray for us because we, I, day to day, I don't like, I'm sweating. I'm sweating. Okay, now I'm hot. Now I'm cold. I don't know what I am. <laughs> am I going to cry or am I going to chew your head off? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. But I'm like, God, please let them forgive me and let me forgive myself and let me love my body and myself in this transition and, and embrace it. And I'm so grateful for the women that um, loved me and reminded me that I am still beautiful, and that's hard to feel when you're going through this, if you don't feel beautiful. You know, weight gain is hard on us, no matter what size you are. I feel beautiful thanks to these women, and I, I, I believe in a holistic approach. That's your thing. It, I mean, it, it's my thing. It may not be your thing, but they have given me their own advice for that, and it's been helpful. So I just want you all to, in your prayer time, pray for us women and our families because it's really challenging challenging and foreign okay well thank, thank you for that you. stephanie um come on up bev it's an honor and a pri privilege to be a part of this church and this caring community we love it i have a niece who leaves today for estonia on a mission trip oh wow she is leaving seven others and would really appreciate your prayer. Um, they have embraced Estonia for several years, um, and they haven't been able to go for the last two. So this is the first one uh, since COVID hit that they've been able to go back. So uh, prayers for their trip to Estonia would be really appreciated. Okay. Come on up, Jim. You know, while, while, while Jim is coming up, uh, you know, so, some of you heard uh, Bev and Terry's testimony at the core, and man, what a story they have. So you guys need to get to know them. Go ahead. Okay. I've got a couple of mission trips now, but uh, in your bulletin, Dave, is, uh, we're going to, on, uh, on September 2nd, but we're collecting school supplies. The backpacks have already been purchased, but we need stuff to put in. And there's a sheet on the table back there. And if, 
if you don't want to do the shopping, like most of us men don't want to do, there's a bucket there you can throw a little dollar or two in. Uh, number two, the prison is back open. I'm going to be going uh, next Saturday morning. I'll be going to uh, the Joe Nyan. And uh, next a week from Wednesday, I'll be going to the tours in Ovalo Joints and Honda. But uh, it's been several months since we've been in. And it's, it's great to get that going. I keep praying for the jail. It's not open yet, but we're waiting for it to come back to us. So thank I, you. I thank think you it's. Pray. I think it's Hebrews that says, remember those that are in prison. So we need to do that. Thank you for that, Jim. Uh, many of you stayed after church last Sunday for the ministry fair. It was the first time that we offered that. It was well attended. Uh, many people signed up in many different areas, had a lot of questions answered about how you can get plugged into uh, this church. And one of the things I, I noticed Jeff Bearden, uh, who's in charge of facilities here, I mean, you got a list and you called that list and Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, you had maybe a dozen people up here unloading mulch and weeding and, and uh, um, anything you want to say about that, Jeff? You guys noticed outside when he came in? It's, it's, it's awesome. So uh, Jeff just stayed up there. He bled little, literally yesterday. He lost. So that was a good time. I just want to thank everybody that came out yes, uh, yesterday morning. Uh, we got a lot done in a short period of time. There's going to be more opportunity in the next couple of months. We'd like to get some of these younger guys involved. But um, we're supposed to be good stewards of this church and this place of worship. And I take it very seriously. So we're looking for some people that feel the same way. All right. So if you're interested, you need to grab hold of Jeff. Uh, before you leave so thank you for that anything else any other uh, things we want to share with one another all right well I'm going to invite you to get your Bibles out and let's get ready to hear from God's word and um, why don't we pray first Father, we thank you so much for gathering us together in your name. And Lord, we pray that the same spirit that inspired your word will inspire our hearts. And Lord, as we open up your word, we're excited for what you want to teach us, where you want to lead us. And, and our deepest prayer this morning is that you will do a work in each of our lives so that we will not only know you better, but we will love you and those around us more deeply. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, and all the people said, amen. Okay, let's um, open up our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, we're going to finish this letter this morning. Um, we talked about it, I don't know, maybe eight weeks, and we talked about Paul wrote this letter. It's basically an older pastor writing to a younger pastor, and yet it's much, much more. Uh, because this is the last letter Paul wrote, and he wrote it in prison. And he didn't have a biological child. Timothy was pretty much just like a son. So we get to hear him pour his heart out to Timothy. And uh, we looked at the first part of chapter 4 last week. We looked at um, Paul urging Timothy to preach the word. You remember that? In season and out of season convince, rebuke, exhort with long suffering and teaching. And then Paul goes into this whole discourse that there will come a time in which people will have itching ears. Remember that? It's another way of saying that they'll gather up teachers in accordance to their own desires who will teach what they want to hear. And uh, we left off last week looking at verse 5. But you be watchful in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And then we uh, dismiss for the ministry fair. And that takes us to verse 6. This is where uh, we're going this morning. And I just want to jump right into it. So let's look at verse 6 together. Paul says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, 
And I want you to think about that for a moment. In the Old Testament, there are many different sacrifices. Uh, there, there were animal sacrifices. There were grain sacrifices. There were drink sacrifices where they would basically pour out some wine. And the thing about a drink offering is that once you poured it out, there was nothing left to pour. And that's what Paul is saying. He's at the end of his life. He's saying, I, I poured my life out to the very last drop. I have nothing left to give. I've left nothing undone. And wow, don't you want to be able to say that at the end of your life? And I don't remember what Travis said. You, you want to be totally used up when you're done with this life. And I think all of us in Christ would, would say amen to that. And I think that's what Paul meant when he says, I'm poured out like a drink offering. And then he goes on in verse 6 to say, the time of my departure is at hand. And there are some people who say that, well, Paul really didn't know his death was coming. Oh, come on. What do you think he's talking about here? And if that's, uh, if that's not enough, look at the next verse. He says in verse 7, I have fought the good fight. Past tense, I fought the good fight, fought. Uh, the word fought in the Greek New Testament comes from a, wor a word from which we get the word agony. And Paul knew how to fight, and he fought well. Uh, we've talked about many times that you can make a case that Paul was the most beat-up guy in the New Testament. Uh, last week, we looked at just some of the things mentioned in 2 Corinthians 11, some of the things he endured for the gospel. And I always think of Lystra because that was Timothy's hometown. And in Lystra, he talks about having been stoned with rocks. And, and the people left him out of town to die. And some say he actually did die. And the church gathered around him and prayed. And he got right back up. And what did he do? He went right back into town. And we talked about how can you stop a guy like that? You can't. That's what made him so formidable. I mean, he kept on fighting. He would go to one town and get beat up. He would go to another town and get beat up over and over and over again. Paul said, I fought the good fight. Don't you want uh, to be able to say that at the end of your life? I fought the good fight. And then he goes on to say, I finished the race. I finished the race. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 talks about how we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Remember that whole passage? And how we need to run and, and strip off every weight and every sin which easily entangles us and run the race with endurance. And I love this next part, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, and here's what I love, the finisher of our faith. And sometimes life is more of a marathon than a race. Sometimes, especially when it gets difficult, it's a matter of just getting one step in front of the other. And Paul ran that race well. And then notice the last thing he says in verse 7, I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith. You know, many people start off well, but not always do people finish well. Paul finished well. He kept the faith. Uh, I heard a, a pastor recently uh, talk about his retirement before a whole group of people. And he talked about his plans after retiring of, of moving to this place closer to his family and doing this and that and taking up this hobby. And, and nothing wrong with any of that. But then he said something that really bothered me. He said, one thing I won't do is that church stuff. And I thought, man, what are you talking about? You're a pastor. How do you stop being a pastor? We've talked many times how there's no retirement plan for a Christian. You, you never reach a point where you just stop ministry. And that's true also, in fact, I would say especially true for pastors. I think of Zeke Zirkel. How many of you guys remember Zeke Zirkel? I mean, he died this last summer at the age of 92 years of old. He was forced to retire from the United Methodist Church because they had something known as mandatory retirement. But there were some churches that didn't have a pastor. They couldn't afford a pastor. And so Zeke would go to place after place that didn't have a pastor. I mean, here recently he went to um, Aransas Pass which meant that every week he and Jeannie would get in a car and travel three hours there and three hours back to preach the gospel. He did that right up until the day he died. 
that's finishing well, isn't it? And you know, I'm 57 years old, and usually people my age in the secular world are thinking about retirement. I can't go there for some reason. I can't see myself retiring. I, I'm doing what I love. I have to wake up sometimes and just pinch myself because I, I can't believe I'm getting paid for, for doing what I love. I, I can't imagine doing anything else. In fact, I don't want to sound too morbid. I mentioned this to Cade yesterday, but I really wouldn't mind dying in the pulpit. I don't think God would allow that because that would be traumatic and it would get people's eyes off Jesus. But you get what I'm saying. I, 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 I just love what I'm... Some of you are going to be talking about that over lunch. Our pastor said he wants to die in the pulpit. Um, <laughs> but you hear what I'm saying. And, and I realize that the older I get, I might slow down. I might not be as sharp. And there might come a time in which I need to hand off the lead pastor to someone maybe a little more younger. But that doesn't mean I'm ever going to stop being a pastor or preaching the gospel. And I think that's part of finishing well, too. Paul handed off the ministry to Timothy. He finished well in every sense of the word. He fought the good fight. He ran the race. He kept the faith. And look at what else he writes. Look at verse 8. He says, Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, talking about the second coming, and not me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know, the crown he's talking about is talking about rewards. There are different words in the Greek New Testament for rewards. There's a crown that has to do with royalty. The crown he's talking about here has to do with rewards. And we talked about rewards. I don't want to go into too much detail this morning, but some people don't like the whole idea of rewards. They say, we're saved by grace, to which I say, amen. But there will be a judgment for believers, not for salvation, because that's happened on the cross, but we'll be judged with what we had an opportunity to do with Jesus based on rewards. And I guess the reason why some people have a hard time with rewards is that um, uh, they say that you shouldn't be motivated by rewards. Well, if you look closely at verse 8, here's the real motivation, his appearing. That's what Paul was after, seeing Jesus face to face. That was the real reward he's talking about. The idea I get is that the closer Paul came to the end of his life, the more clearly he could see Jesus. The more clearly he could see Jesus, the faster he ran. He couldn't wait to see Jesus. He wasn't focusing on all the pain and the sorrow. He was focusing on the joy and excitement of seeing Jesus face to face. And then beginning with verse 9, he gets very personal. He says, be diligent to come to me quickly. And by the way, we don't know if Timothy made it to see Paul in time. I like to think he did. And then he mentions Demas. Look at verse 10. He says, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. You know, we don't know much about Demas except that he forsook Paul and that he went after the things of the world. So he walked away from the faith. And I like to think that he came back. We don't know. But let me ask you, who among us hasn't had times of weaknesses that we walked away. We call it backslidden, right? I think of Peter. The day Jesus was betrayed in the garden, remember that whole thing? He follows the soldiers to the courtyard. He denies Jesus three separate times. He walked away from the faith, but he came back and he learned something. So Hopefully that was the case with Demas. And then he mentions two other names in verse 10. He says, Christians for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Uh, these are basically people he sent on ministry um, trips. And then he says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. He's talking about the physician, right? Luke, the physician. Um, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke as well as the book of Acts. In fact, a little bit of trivia uh, Luke actually wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else. You say, what about Paul? Well, Paul wrote more letters. Luke narrowly beat out Paul writing more words. You could actually make a case that the closest thing we have to the gospel of Paul is the gospel of Luke, since Luke spent so much time with Paul. 
But Luke's with me, he says in verse 11. And then how about the next part? Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. Some of you know the story of Mark. On Paul's first missionary trip, uh, they took Mark, who was Barnabas' nephew. And halfway in the trip, for whatever reason, he got scared and left home. And when they began to plan out the second missionary trip, what happened? Barnabas wanted to take Mark, and Paul essentially said, over my dead body. And the disagreement was so sharp that they parted company and never really came together again as far as we know. But something obviously happened. There's a lesson that people can change because Mark obviously changed. He learned from his failure. He probably learned from that second trip with Barnabas to the point that now Paul says, bring Mark with you for he's useful to me in ministry. And then in verse 12, he says, Antichicus I have sent to Ephesus. Remember, that's where Timothy was. Maybe he was sending Tychicus to take Timothy's place while Timothy went to see Paul. We don't know. And then in verse 13, he gets very practical. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Choaz when you come. And then he says in the books, especially the parchments, he's talking about the scriptures. And then in verse 14, he talks about another person, Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. I love how Paul puts that. You know, he hurt him deeply. We don't know exactly what Alexander did, but I love Paul's attitude. Let God deal with him. And you know, I've been a pastor for over 30 years, and Early on in my ministry, I, I, I made a lot of mistakes. I like to think my first church, I made most of my mistakes in ministry. I would say the wrong thing in the wrong way. I would step on toes. I would step on landmines. And sometimes people would say things. And the thing with rumors, rumors sometimes take on a life of its own. And you can make yourself go crazy by chasing rumors. And finally, there reached a point, maybe my fifth year in the ministry, that I was like, I'm going to let God fight my battles. And there's great peace in that, isn't there? Just to let the Lord fight your battles. Let him be your rock. Let him be your fortress. Let him be your ever-present help. And that's what Paul was like. Hey, may the Lord repay him according to his works. And yet in verse 15, Paul thinks it's necessary to warn Timothy about him. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. And then I want you to notice verse 16. I mean, everyone here for a moment, because these are some of the saddest words in Scripture. Look at verse 16. Paul says, at my first defense, Paul's in prison. This isn't like when he was under house arrest. He was in prison basically fighting for his life. He was on death row, which meant that they dug a hole 20 feet deep. They dropped him in. They pulled him out, you know, to see the judge for the first time. At his first hearing, he said, no one stood with me. Take that in for a moment. No one stood with me, he said, but all forsook me. And look at Paul's attitude. May it not be charged against them. Think about the number of people Paul touched, the lives he reached, how many people he led to the Lord, how many people he baptized, how many churches he started. And yet here at the end of his life, what does he say? No one stood with me. And I love his attitude. May it not be charged against them. Kind of sounds like Christ, right? Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. But look at what he says in verse 17. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. And he goes on to say, also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I'm going to say something, and I'm so likely to be misunderstood, so I'm going to really try to spend a little more time on this. I really believe with all my heart, okay, I'm going to be misunderstood, so hear me out, that until God is done with you, and when I say done, I'm, I don't mean that 
he wads you up and throws you away like a piece of trash. Till you served your purpose, you're bulletproof. Now, think about that for a moment. You're bulletproof. That's not an excuse, Bruce, to live careless, reckless lives, okay? Uh, but you understand what I'm saying. This is really a matter of faith here. Do we really believe what the Scriptures say about God or not? What does the Bible say about God? Big theological word, he's sovereign. What does that mean? It means he's over and above all things. It means that he's in complete control. In fact, try this on for size. Nothing happens without his permission. Do we really believe that? If you believe that, well then, until you served your God-given purpose here on earth, you're bulletproof. Again, the Bible says don't test the Lord, right? Except when it comes to giving. Malachi says, hey, test me in this, and I'll open the floodgates. But even Jesus, when, when uh, the, Satan tempted him, he said it's written, do not test. Travis actually knew a guy. You remember the guy with the coat? What, what was his story? He thought he was immortal. And he, he was careless and reckless, and, and, and he, like, went out on a massive, busy highway and thought, you know, man, I'm, I'm, don't test God in that kind of way. But understand, have faith that if God is calling you to do something, God knows how to take care of his own. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. And he says amen here. Notice that. And it's like, he says amen, he thinks he's done, and then he's, oh, wait, i got to mention a few more people. And in verse 19, he says, greet Prisca, that's, some of your Bibles say Priscilla and Aquila, they were a married couple, in the household of Onesiphorus. Verse 20, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I've left in Miletus sick. Verse 21, do your utmost to come before winter. And he says, Eubulus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. And then he ends this letter like he often begins and ends all his letters, talking about the grace of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Now, what can we take from this letter? What can we take from this passage? I think the key is to kind of figure out where you fit into the story. Maybe some of you feel like, Paul, you've walked the walk for years. You've been faithful. But maybe you're at a point in your life where you feel tired or worn out. Maybe you feel abandoned. Maybe you feel lonely. Maybe you're suffering here in silence. You know, there's probably pain in every single pew here and as we often talk about after the service off to my right there'll be an opportunity for you to come to people to pray people love to pray and love you if you would just let them maybe you feel like Paul and and you've been hurt maybe you've been hurt by the church maybe you've been hurt by a pastor maybe unintentionally I've hurt you Well, we need to make that right. Um, There's no reason for anyone here to leave hurt and wounded. Let's take care of that this morning. Maybe there's someone like Timothy who's just starting out in ministry and you're kind of unsure, and you need someone like Paul to step alongside of you. We want to pray for you as well. But maybe, maybe there's someone like Demas. Maybe you've walked away. Or maybe you're going through the motions, but you know that your heart really isn't with Christ. You're doing your own thing. You've heard me say many times before, you might be a thousand steps away from God, but it's only one step back. Isn't that good news? It's only one step back. And maybe there's someone here that needs to take that step. Or maybe there's someone that needs to take that first step step in your life and we would love to 
move up alongside of you and pray for you and, and baptize you and, and make you a part of the body of Christ. Whatever God is telling you to do this morning, we want to be a part of it. Amen? So I'm going to invite everyone to stand at this time, and let's have a word of prayer. And again, while the musicians are coming up, off here to the right, please, 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 if you have a need for prayer, would you come up? Uh, you can come up during the, the last song. You could come up after the service. Uh, if you would rather just come up silently and pray at the altar, this is your altar as well. If you want to pray for someone you know who's lost, I encourage you to come. Let's not be shy about our faith. Let's let the Lord be truly Lord of our lives. So let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you've spoken through your word. And we thank you for a life well lived in Paul. He fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. And Lord, uh, we want to be like that. We want to be totally poured out for you. So at the end, we have nothing left to give but our very lives. Lord, thank you that you know how to take care of your own. Thank you that you promise that you will never leave or forsake us. People will often stumble and fall and mess up and let people down. You will never let us down. So, Lord, we invite you to speak into our lives, especially right here, right now. If there's someone that needs encouragement, someone that needs strength, someone that's hurting, maybe you're hurting so deeply that you're not even sure where you're hurting except that you're hurting. Maybe you feel like the church has wounded you or a pastor. Lord, we invite you to fall on us and heal us as only you can. Maybe there's someone here that wants to come back to you and you're standing here and you're wondering, how can I make this work? Well, that's the thing. You can't make it work. You simply surrender and let him do the work. Invite him in. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. He'll fill you. He'll give you a new purpose and a new life. Lord, whatever you want to do among your people, we say, be our God, be our King. Thank you that you're over and above all things. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship. The altar is open. The prayer team will be over here to my right.
that stone was moved for good for the land that conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in love for the soul of all who come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the Spirit lit the flame now his gospel through the mold shall not feel, shall not faint by his blood and by his name in his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Now may the Lord who saved us, who walked on this earth to show us how to live, may he be with you through this week, and may you share his grace with everyone you meet. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. And by the way, uh, dinner is served. Make sure you uh, thank those who are right in the kitchen right now. Um, and let's, uh, if you're grateful for the food, would you say amen? amen. Go in peace. There's prayer up here, guys. <laughs>